I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. And as they used to say back in the day, <laughs> we're going to see y'all in the funny papers. So guys, I'm going to let you in on a little something. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on something right now. Something, something big. Like, bigger than any US 101 episode that I've produced thus far. And I've been thinking about this project for quite some time. Now, I'd say about three years it's been on my mind. But I've had to put it on the back burner because, you know, I was in grad school for the last two years. But now I've started gathering some materials and starting to get the things I need to start doing the research that is necessary for this project. And I'm not going to get too specific as to what exactly it is I'm going to be working on, but let's just say it has to do with a certain comic book character that I've been quite fond of for, oh, I'd say most of my life. But in thinking about that bigger project, guys, it had me also thinking about what we should discuss on this week's episode. So let's talk about it, man. Comics. Comics have been a major, major part of American pop culture throughout most of the 20th century and especially the 21st century, especially with the rise of uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the, um, oh, let's say, muted appearance of the DC films. Because seriously, seriously, man, Superman needs a more pronounced screen presence and it isn't going to happen by making the Man of Steel the Man of Emo. Why are you trying to make him mopey? That doesn't work for that character. That character is supposed to inspire hope in the audience and is supposed to make us believe in an ideal that we are supposed to aspire to achieve and... <laughs> you know what? Nope, nope. Not going to do that. Not going to do that today. Y'all ain't ready for that one yet. So yeah, guys, comics, comic book characters, comic book movies. These are things that have become pop culture touchstones today and no longer really just belong to the groups of people that were identified as nerds or geeks. So for today's episode, guys, I thought we would take a look back, back into when comics were a thing that people all around the United States rallied around. And I know what you're thinking. You might be thinking that, oh, it all has to do with, with this image right here, this iconic image right here. But you would be... You would be wrong. In reality, if you want to go back to the beginning of comics in the United States, you want to think of this image. Let me explain. For as long as humans have been around, art presented in a sequential manner has been around in one form or another. You can look back at cave drawings, Egyptian hieroglyphics, the hieroglyphics done by the Mayans, artwork done by the Greeks and the Romans. Using art to tell stories has been a staple of human behavior for quite some time. But art and drawings weren't only used to tell tales, they were also used to convey messages, in many cases, political messages, in a manner that would reach wider audiences that couldn't read, which a few centuries ago, was a lot of people. This art was usually a satirical take on politicians or major issues of the day. However, these works were usually only one panel, and for the most part, that's how most of these cartoons were presented. Case in point, guys, the 1754 political cartoon that was done by Benjamin Franklin called Join or Die, we've talked about it on the show before, uh, it's only a one panel cartoon drawing. And any words in these cartoons were usually presented as a caption underneath the drawing to convey the idea of what was being presented. Now, some early works like those of Thomas Rowlinson or George Townsend would incorporate speech bubbles in their cartoons to give a character or character's voice. But the entire work, again, was usually a single drawing. Now, in 1827, a Swiss artist by the name of Rodolphe Topfer would also create cartoons, which would also lampoon his society and his culture, similar to the artists like Hogarth and Townsend. But unlike those artists, Topfer is credited as the first artist to introduce multi-panel cartoons, which introduce a longer story and a character or characters that appear more than once, thus creating a strip of cartoons, if you will. And then a decade later, guys, Topfer would create a collection of strips called The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck and put all those strips in a 40-page book. This comic book would become so popular that it would even be exported to the United States and reprinted and put inside of American newspapers in 1842. Now, in the 19th century, newspapers are the way that Americans get their information. As such, it was also a forum that artists would use to present their works while also commenting on political and national issues of the day. Artists like Thomas Nast, one of the most famous American political cartoonists, had his works printed in newspapers and was considered a precursor 
to American comic strips. Matter of fact, we've talked about Nast on the show way back when the show first started. We talked about him as the man who would introduce uh, the image of Santa Claus that we all know today. So while cartoons were a part of newspapers in the 19th century, the newspaper comic strip that we know today, that we're very familiar with today, wouldn't come about until the year 1895. And why did the comic strip finally make its appearance in a newspaper? Was it because of uh, artistic license? Was it because of an overflow of creativity by the artistic community trying to find ways to push the boundaries of telling stories? <laughs> no. It was because there was a rivalry between two New York newspaper titans and all they were trying to do was basically outsell each other. In the 1890s, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer were obsessed with winning. They wanted their newspapers, the New York Journal and the New York World respectively, to be the ones that New Yorkers read and would do whatever was necessary to competitively crush each other, especially since more and more immigrants were coming to the US during this time. You have more and more people coming to the United States, more and more people living in New York City, which means you've got to try to raise your circulation. You gotta get more papers out on the street because the more that people read your paper, the more money you make. So these guys were doing everything they could to try to come up with ways to sell as many papers as possible, sensational headlines, out insane news stories, having newsboys from both papers fight each other in the streets and try to sabotage each other's corners. And another strategy that one of the publishers, specifically Joseph Pulitzer, would implement to try to gain a foothold on Hearst was printing cartoons in his newspaper, but in color. In 1895, Joseph Pulitzer gets one over on William Randolph Hearst by obtaining a color printer. Now, why is a color printer important during this time? Because if you print things in color, which is something that isn't really happening in newspapers during this time, you print things in color, the, the, the picture, whatever you're trying to print, pops more off the page, it, it's more eye-catching. People want to know, exactly why is this in color? What's so important about it? Pulitzer also went and hired the artist Richard Outcult, who was the creator of a comic strip called Hogan's Alley that featured a character named Mickey Dugan, a small kid with a bald head who wore a yellow nightshirt and would become known as the Yellow Kid. The strip, which was multi-paneled, also incorporated the character's voice by giving him words within the panel. Now, while speech bubbles weren't used, the words would appear on his yellow nightshirt. On top of that, the style of the kid's dialogue was written in a dialect familiar to immigrants who lived on the Lower East Side of New York City, where the comic was situated. And one of the main reasons the strip, The Yellow Kid, appealed to immigrants so much was because it also kind of served as a representation of immigrants in the media. Immigrants, especially Irish immigrants, saw themselves in the panels of the Yellow Kid's adventures. This comic strip featuring Dugan's antics as a street urchin who got into all sorts of antics while also mocking the snobbery of New York high society would prove to be so popular that it actually boosted sales of Pulitzer's New York world. But not to be outdone by his rival, a year later in 1896, William Randolph Hearst follows Joseph Pulitzer's example and gets himself a color printer so he can start printing things in color. And on top of that, he takes the author of the Hogan's Alley strip, the Yellow Kid strip, Richard Outcult, away from Pulitzer's paper and hires him to do the strip at his paper. So Pulitzer, not wanting to lose his golden, or in this case, yellow goose, uh, hires an artist by the name of George Lux to continue the Yellow Kid strip at his paper. But the success of the Yellow Kid would be felt by other newspapers who immediately scrambled to get their own comic strip sensations. And in 1897, the comic strip The Cats and Jammer Kids by Rudolph Dirks debuted and continued the multi-panel style of storytelling. And again, this is another comic strip that focuses on immigrants. Now, in the case of The Cats and Jammer Kids, you have two German kids who basically, they just run around, I mean, if you look at the panel, they basically just run around and just, you know, pull pranks and just try to get into trouble. And at the very end of the comic strip, they always end up getting reprimanded by their mom or some other uh, adult character. It, it was very, like, not political at all. It didn't try to comment on anything of the day. It was just trying to go for slapstick comedy. <laughs> Now, just a quick heads up, if you guys end up looking up strips of Hogan's Alley, the Yellow Kid, the Cats and Jammer Kids, you're, you're going to notice that uh, while, yes, they're about immigrants, um, the artists also take a lot of license on how they present those immigrants, and when you read these strips, it's not in the most flattering light. A lot of these strips are, are very racist, they're, 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 they're quite offensive. Um, if you tried to print them today, they, they really, they wouldn't work. 
back. But the importance of these strips, even though yes, they are racist and xenophobic, lies in the fact that these strips, the Yellow Kid, Hogan Dally, the Cats and Jammer Kids, are now introducing a brand new style of art, a brand new genre into the American pop culture realm. So newspapers start clamoring for artists to submit their works so that they can start presenting these comic strips in their newspapers. And when you have more artists coming into the new genre of comic strip drawing, comic strip writing, you also start to get uh, new genres of storytelling within these strips. It's not just comedy anymore. By 1912, readers can't get enough of comic strips in newspapers. So much so that the New York Evening Journal in 1912 dedicates one whole page of its newspaper just to comic strips. And by the 1920s and 1930s, guys, comic strips start making it into the newspapers with characters that we are still very much familiar with today. Strips like Tarzan, Dick Tracy, Popeye, and Little Orphan Annie. Also, by the 1930s, newspapers began creating comic sections of the newspapers that were in full color. And in 1934, a man by the name of Maxwell Gaines would take the comic strip game in the United States to a brand new level. Gaines would reprint comic strips that appeared in newspapers, but make them half the size that appeared in the newspapers in order to put them into a book form. And in May of 1934, the first American comic book, Famous Funnies Number 1, appeared and gave readers a large collection of stories to read all at once. Also, fun fact about Maxwell Gaines, that man actually had happens to be the father of William Gaines, who would later go on to become the publisher of Mad Magazine. See, it's all connected, guys. And as the 30s continue on, guys, more and more comic strips begin to gain national acclaim as they start to appear in newspapers across the country and become very popular. But also, in the 1930s, two aspiring comic strip artists in Cleveland, Ohio, named Jerome Siegel and Joseph Schuster, are having difficulty uh, selling their comic strip idea to newspapers who dismiss the strip as something just boring and, and unoriginal. That is, until 1938, when their strips would be put into a slightly longer story form and be a part of a collection of stories that would appear in a book called Action Comics Number 1, and would feature Siegel and Schuster's character on the cover, holding a car above his head and smashing it into a boulder, and emblazoned on his chest would be the letter... Ah, but that's, that's, that's a story for a whole other day. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be interested in... And hearing that story. And that is it for this episode of US 101, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Really do appreciate it. And I want to ask you guys, what is your favorite newspaper comic strip? When I was growing up, of course, you had the classics. You had like Peanuts, you had Garfield, but then you had ones like, weird ones like Funky Winker Bean, and then there'd be reprintings of Dick Tracy, and then it's just like, you know, Beetle Bailey, and the Family Circus, and like all these comic strips. Well, what's your favorite newspaper comic strip? Let me know. Thanks again for watching the video, and for those of you that have been subscribing to the channel, liking the videos, sharing them, leaving comments, and, and jumping into a dialogue with me. Sincerely appreciate that, guys. And as always, you can hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those links down below in the description box. Guys, I will see you next week for a brand new episode of US 101. Until then, I am all done. Have you, have you figured out what my big project might be about yet? You, you're starting to see it a little bit clearer now?